this is the Pixel Laundry Retouching Academy. In this episode, we'll be talking about achieving perfect skin in Photoshop every single time. Also, we'll be talking about client revisions and how to handle them like a pro. All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, my name is Rick Navarro. I am a high-end retoucher and uh, the lead art director at Pixel Laundry. And uh, today we're gonna talk about skin and client revisions. Um, I had this project come across my desk just recently and I thought it'd be a perfect one for the YouTube channel um, to kind of go over skin and to go over uh, dealing with client revisions as that's kind of just the nature of what we do um, as, a, as a company and as uh, anyone who's retouching uh, professionally uh, knows um, you're going to deal with revisions no matter how good uh, the retouch or how solid the retouch is. So. Um, this particular image came back to me. Actually, this was one that our company had already done for this particular client. And um, they had a repurposing of the image. So initially this, this project was gonna be used for online viewing only, right? So that's one of the parameters that we kind of always look at when we're assessing uh, how our retouching workflow is going to proceed, right? Like what is the end usage? Uh, my personal mantra and philosophy after having worked in this industry, I don't know, 10, 15 years at this point, um, is end usage dictates everything. It's going to dictate your workflow. There's a ton of videos on YouTube that are, uh, you know, super, super meticulous, super high end. And while I think that's amazing, it just really depends on the usage and what the end uh, the end viewer or how the end viewer is going to be seeing these images um, you don't want to spend hours and hours and hours on end if you have uh, multiple images you know let's let's say uh, fashion ecom where there's a lot of images to process in a very short amount of time and you have to get through them all um, you're not going to be spending you're not going to be spending all this time doing um, meticulous beauty style of retouch uh, for every image so you know the question becomes how do I process these image these images as efficiently and as effectively as possible um, at the highest quality but by playing the game smart right smart it, it, there's no sense in retouching every single pore if it's only ever going to be viewed on a phone okay so we're, we're getting these images in at like 5k 4k um, they're shot on the largest, you know, medium format back that you can imagine. And the end usage is going to be, you know, a, a 600 by 700, you know, iPhone somewhere. Um, so it, it doesn't make sense. It's not economically sound or uh, a good use of time to be processing these images in a capacity that says, I'm gonna spend an hour per image, but I've got 300 images I need to get through and I've got about two or three days to do it. Now, obviously that may depend on how large your team is, but um, these are the this is the, this is the method of thought that you want to go through to kind of try to figure this out, right? Like uh, this is one of the client probing questions that we might ask in the beginning while we're evaluating our clients and saying, hey, what's your end usage? You know, is this particular batch going to be used for ecom? Is it going to be only on screen? Is it going to be uh, printed? Is it large format print? So on and so forth. So that's a question you want to know right up front when you're dealing with clients because it's going to dictate your retouching workflow. Now, in this particular case, um, we had already done this image for this client, as I mentioned before. Uh, however, th at the time, the usage for this particular image was only on screen. Um, even, even with on screen images, we might work at a higher resolution than we, than we might normally otherwise. Um, but for the most part, if we know that it's only going to be viewed on screen, uh, meaning on phone, on the internet only. It's never going to be printed. It's never going to be large format like a billboard or like a um, um, like a display for a convention or something. Um, you know, we may choose to downres the file in a way that keeps a large amount of information, um, but doesn't keep the file size or the weight of the file very large. Um, in this particular instance, they had come back and said, hey, we want this, this image redone because we're gonna use it for a convention, a, a, large, um, a large format print, uh, and it's going to be used for uh, convention purposes, like a large banner print behind a, you know, a, a booth or something. 
So right off the bat, that tells me a couple things. It tells me that the normal the normal 8-bit processing that we may, color processing that we may use on most, I would say 90%, 95% of our images is not gonna work. Um, there's a good chance you're gonna get color banding when you go to a color print. Now, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I feel like the only exception to that is if you're doing something like billboards, and it really kind of just depends on your printer because the printing, uh, the printers have uh, proprietary software oftentimes that will upscale your images from what would otherwise be a low res image to a high res image without it losing any resolution. So in that case, you'd wanna find out exactly what the printer wants and then go from there. I did a billboard some time back where we actually down res the image to either 150 or 72 DPI and that was as large as the printer wanted it. And we did it at scale, so it was like one inch to one foot. So, you know, there's there's no sense in creating a, a, a PSD or a PSB in Photoshop that is 35 feet across. It'll crash even the highest and best machines. So, you know, the the printer had us down the images to a PDF at a smaller resolution, but it was to scale and their in-house software was able to upscale it. And then honestly, if you're looking at large format printing that large, um, where it's not going to be seen up close, oftentimes those images are not, they're not, they're not crisp. They're not tack sharp at all. They're actually soft. And when you see them from a distance, they look sharp, um, but those images are not meant to be looked up close. So anyhow, this image was gonna be used for large format print and uh, we decided to up res it. We actually decided to start from the beginning. Um, and what we wanted to do was start from a base image and up res it from there. So we converted to 16 bit and uh, immediately restarted the retouch. Now, the reason I'm talking over a lot of what's actually happening on screen right now is because a lot of this is very basic retouching. Um, you'll see in the layers section here that I've got a frequency separation um, uh, set up and we use frequency separation when it's appropriate, right? And in this case, it's a large format. Um, it's gonna be printed large. It's gonna be seen up close. Um, the details are important. Um, so in this case, we'll use frequency separation. Now, if you don't know what frequency separation is, uh, we'll be creating a series of videos on that uh, sometime in the future. If I haven't already, there should be a link uh, popping up right about now. Um, but if you don't know, a brief explanation of it is, is like sound, color works in frequencies and your high frequencies are going to give you texture and your low frequencies are going to give you color. And this is a, such a great trick to use in a lot of different scenarios, but especially in something like beauty retouching because it allows you to separate the texture from the color and you can get into these details at, at a really almost a micro level, pore level, as you can see, I'm getting super tight in here. Um, and you can address some of these issues um, separately, which gives you a greater level of control. So what you see here, I've got a black and white adjustment layer on there. And what that's doing is, is allowing me to see details that I would not otherwise be able to see. In addition to uh, moles and just kind of skin imperfections, we see a lot of discoloration, shifts in color, and I'm very quickly running through here and trying to even out the skin uh, by getting rid of this. The client has uh, told us that they don't want any of these sort of things. That's another thing you might want to ask, you know, like some clients want moles and kind of natural skin imperfections, um, you know, that kind of lend themselves to the uniqueness of us as individuals and human beings. Other clients want flawless skin. So, you know, this thing with flawless skin is, is we see a lot of it, right? There, I mean, again, there's a ton of stuff on YouTube. There's a ton of stuff out there. You know, this becomes like a philosophical thing, approach. You know, how and what do you mean by flawless skin? How brushed is too airbrushed? How far is too far? You know, um, a lot of what I see out there tends to be unnatural. Like it, it looks retouched, even if it's super, super clean. So, it, you know, if that's the goal, that's what you're going for, then, you know, that's one thing. Um, but my goal is always to kind of maintain a certain level of realism uh, in addition to uh, you know, like a flawless retouch, you know, like the skin looks amazing, um, but it doesn't look improbable. Like I see some of these beauty retouches. Now, granted, I understand that that's the style, but for my personal preference, taste and style, um, I tend to lean to something that's a little bit 
somewhere between polished and unpolished. And it works. And a lot of clients that I work with really, really like that. So we kind of stay with that. So this is my approach. And basically I'm just here in the texture layer in the high frequency layer, as you can see, and I'm going back and forth and I'm adjusting both color and texture. I don't want repeating patterns, obviously. This is kind of like signature Photoshop uh, giveaway, right? Repeating patterns, whether that's in the poor textures or um, you know, in, in, in shadows and shades and anything crispy like hair, um, I don't want that to repeat. So I'm kind of going through here meticulously and, and, and you'll see me go in super tight and you'll also see me kind of zoom out because again, um, when you're in super, super tight the whole time, you're going to miss things that is going that are going to be seen uh, from a far away. Now, again, here you go. I turned off the black and white checker layer. That's what I call a checker layer. And the reason you go black and white is because um, the, the rods and cones in your eyes do not uh, see detail in color as great as they do in black and white. This is like a retouching trick that's been kind of floating around. And some people understand why you do it. There's another way you could do it. You could do it with curves layer. You can uh, put a curves layer on here and kind of um, uh, give like a, a squiggly up and down instead of like an S curve. You can plot points at the top, bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom. Um, and that gives you like a, an up down, almost like a W looking spline curve. And that will manipulate the colors in the image on an extreme level, but because it's a, a, an adjustment layer, it's not actually affecting the image. All it's doing is it's, it's a tool for you to be able to use to kind of see the skin almost like on an X-ray level. And um, that's addressing like, you know, colors that you're not gonna be able to see with the naked eye. So that's why we use that. I like the black and white layer, it just kind of depends on the image. In this particular one, I used the black and white and it worked really well. As you can kind of already start to see, the skin is looking super, super clean. Um, I want to maintain all of that texture, um, all those beautiful highlights, the shots um, that this particular client provides for us are, are relatively clean almost all the time. That is not always the case. Um, there's a lot of mom and pop shops that we work with or a, a lot of, you know, maybe e-com, um, small depart marketing departments that don't have the budget or the education or the experience on how to shoot these images or they just don't have the, the equipment. I, I mean, I've worked with so many different clients that literally like they're shooting in a closet and they got one light to try to make their stuff work. Now, it, it, it's, it's definitely harder. It's definitely not, it doesn't make our jobs easier. And sometimes it takes a little bit of hand holding to deal with the clients, especially when they want revisions on exactly what can be done and can't be done. Because, you know, so, sometimes this thing, um, you know, the retouching catches the brunt of the blame if the images look off. But I like to educate my clients very, very gently, um, you know, because it, first off, if they're providing these images, as their chances are that they don't, they don't really know. They don't really know, you know, what it's supposed to look like. And that's why it hasn't, it's passed muster with whomever is dictating what needs to happen or, or, or who, uh, whomever is dictating like that these images are green lit for, you know, for processing and, and ready to go. Um, they usually don't know or are coming from another background or work in another department and have been given the authority to kind of come in and say yay or nay over the e-com images, but it may not be their expertise. So, you know, sometimes those things are important to find out. And, and at that point, you're going to kind of talk to them and, and, and establish a rapport with them and say, hey, I've noticed X, Y and Z in your images. Did you know about this or have you been thinking about that? You know, um, the exposure on your images is is too light or there is, you know, there's a lot of sensor dust that we're seeing. You know, have you guys cleaned out your lenses lately? All of these things affect the post processing, you know, and the old adage that, you know, we'll fix it in Photoshop doesn't always fly and they need to really understand that garbage in will definitely be garbage out. There's only so much that you can do and you want to make sure that obviously you're putting your best foot forward, but we have to be realistic with our expectations in that not everything is possible or, or the best use of time, let's say. And, and, and that's, that's also one that tends to kind of hit home with these guys because a lot of them are, their budgets are dictated, you know, by, by timing and by how much um, they can or can spend on a particular project. So it's like, okay, yeah, I can fix this, but it's going to take me, you know, X amount of time to do that. Or it's gonna take me, you know, um, I'm not going to be able to finish your entire batch if I spend all the time fixing your mistakes. You know, what may take an hour in Photoshop could take literally seconds on set. This is really true in lingerie. Um, you know, a, a flipped um, 
waistband or a bra strap that literally just takes seconds for a stylist on set to come in and uh, make sure everything looks right before that exposure is taken. Um, can take a very long 10, 10, 15, 20 minutes in Photoshop to make it look right, blend the skin, make sure the shadows look good, make sure the indentations look right, make sure the strap doesn't look too fake, you know, and, and all that stuff is literally a matter of like, oh, let me fix that real quick, flip it, flatten it out, oh, looks good, we're done. Uh, so, you know, sometimes the clients have to be educated on that. Now, sometimes they do know and there's nothing else that you can do and they're really just, you know, hoping and praying and relying on you as the post processing team to get it done. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's kind of a play it by ear situation, but you got to understand what tools you have in your in your toolbox, you know, and when to push back, when to take it on the chin, and, you know, and when to just do the work. So again, I'm, I'm flipping back and forth here. I've been going back and forth between the high frequency and the low frequency just to make sure that everything is on par. This is a very small section of skin, so it's actually relatively easy to kind of manage and go through to make sure that all the tonal values are nice and even. Anywhere I'm seeing little uh, discrepancies or unevenness, I'm kind of going through, and then I'm cross-checking back and forth, both zooming in, I'm zooming out, and then I'm also looking at the black and white as well as the color to get an overall balance. So what I'm doing is I'm going through and I'm highlighting all of these little areas that may, um, that catch my eye, that kind of stick out, things that, you know, feel off or, or, or may draw attention to itself that we, we don't want. And I'm circling them and I'm using content aware fill, uh, which is um, shift and delete and make sure that your dialog box is set to content aware fill for that. And I'm getting rid of all of these things very, very quickly. Most of this stuff is going to be in the high, uh, the high frequency layer, and that's where a lot of the texture is, and um, it's very easy to get through very quickly. There was already a fair amount of texture and noise in the glasses, so what I'm doing here is I'm making a selection of the lenses, and I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit more noise in there. Now you'll notice as a color, and when you're adding noise, it's going to uh, in, be influenced by the color, whatever color you have in your foreground or your background, depending on, on how you have it set. Um, I actually like that. Um, I don't think blue was the right color I wanted, so eventually I come back in here and change it because there isn't really blues in the area, but the the image overall is kind of warm. As you can kind of see, there's, there's red, browns, maybe some magentas in there. So I'm going to I'm going to test out a, an adjustment layer uh, by um, actually I, I I just went directly on the layer. Sometimes I do this too, like um, since I know I'm fairly confident in how it's going to affect it, I just drop the opacity way down, like to like three percent, five or three percent. But in the meantime, um, I bring it back up so I can kind of check these warmer tones and see if it's going to do anything for the overall image blend a little bit better it's always it's always a, an issue of, of making sure it sits well and five percent like I feel like that's okay and I think I leave it there um, in another round in the second round of revisions the client actually came back and asked that the lenses be darkened and that the, the amount of light in each side be evened out so um, I don't think we show that in this particular video but basically I do the same thing where I attach a uh, an adjustment layer of levels and or curves and use that glasses layer that I just made the fill layer that's listed as layer one right now um, I come back and use that as a clipping mask and darken and even and uh, even out those glasses so that it helps. Now what I'm doing right here is uh, my dodge and burn and that adds a little, fair, a little bit of contrast, a little bit of um, you know pushing and pulling uh, if you're familiar with lighting and just drawing illustration um, a darkness recedes and lightness you know proceeds it comes forward darkness goes back and light comes forward. So by darkening some of these areas very very carefully very slowly and very lightly at a time I build up it's a painting technique um, that pushes and pulls things and also highlights the features on a face that uh, may uh, may be flattering you know or may not be flattering and you may want to kind of you know push away and again this kind of keeps a very very natural uh, but very clean retouching style to the images and uh, it works very well. You can see I'm, I'm toggling on and off that just the burn layer. And basically all I've done is created a curves layer and I have pulled it down a bit. 
And again, that, I, I'm with a very low opacity brush. Uh, I'm basically going in here, I've got it at 20%, and very softly I'm building up a painting on that black, that black mask. Again, black, uh, black conceals and white reveals. So with a white brush, I'm going in and very lightly um, um, darkening areas and pushing them back and creating creating shade and texture, um, uh, visual texture. If I overstep my bounds, like if I go out of bounds or go somewhere where I don't feel like um, the shadow is, or I've gotten, or I'm bleeding over into certain areas, then I'll I'll hit that X X key, flip my foreground and background, and paint out where I have applied the burn layer. Um, I went back into my texture, into my high frequency, and I'm addressing some little issues that you come, that I'm coming across. You know, this this is a process. It's, it's very much a journey. It's never, you know, you want to build your layer structure. As you can see, I'm, I'm working non-destructively. Uh, I'm not committing necessarily to anything. That background layer is my original. I do keep it in there. I've seen some people who don't. I've seen some techniques where, you know, you don't want to, um, or they're trying to reduce the file size. Um, just. But what I have found is like just through the years, having an extra there, like, you know, these files are gonna be large anyways, and an extra few megabytes to have that original image is so worth it because sometimes you go too far, or sometimes you, you know, you mess up and it's like, maybe your history states wasn't set, you know, in your preferences uh, or, you know, for, for, or you flattened your images because you thought at the time, like I was good. And then a revision comes back and it's like, I need to go back and I need to have, I need to work from a more original surface. Um, always having that there is so crucial, so crucial to my personal workflow and one I highly recommend. So I, I keep that there. And as you can see, my, my layer structure isn't isn't too too crazy right now. I've only got a few, few layers in there, but it, it allows me the latitude and the flexibility to kind of do what I need to do. So again, I, I'm going in here and sometimes you'll see these little blurry patches and that's really what I'm addressing. I did a, a, a broad first pass where I'm just kind of getting rid of everything and anything that I see you know, at first glance. And then now I'm kind of coming in here with some of these details. Now I've gone over into uh, my dodge layer and same technique. I pull that up and then I fill it with black and with a very light brush, I come in here and start to add the highlights. Now with, with this layer in particular, you gotta be super, super careful. And this is where it starts to get glaze or it can look blotchy or splotch, you know, um, uh, splotchy like where the, the skin is unnaturally highlight. Uh, a lot of times, like if there's a natural highlight, which in this you can see, she's got some areas that are really kind of dewy and glowy. You wanna enhance those and not make them you know, um, big spots because it just doesn't look natural. So again, I'll zoom in and zoom out. And some of these highlights on the glasses, I'm punching them up a little bit just for the specularity um, to give them the kind of a shine. And again, I'm not, I'm not, you know, reinventing the wheel. I'm letting the image tell me where it needs it. And you can see, I'm just hitting all of these highlights where they already exist. I'm just kind of pushing them, punching them up a pinch. That way I'm not creating anything weird or anything new that doesn't look right. And again, pull out, check the layers. This outfit is pretty shiny, so I'm not really gonna mess with that too much unless it comes back as a specific request. But these, uh, these the tops of these muscles and like these, you know, these ridges on the throat and on the body, I'm looking for where the light is hitting the body naturally already. And then I'm just going to enhance that pushing the shadows back, bringing the highlights forward. At this point, we're almost there. Kind of going through, double checking, looking for um, you know unsymmetrical shapes, last minute little texture details, um, 
again, this is a this is a high res image that's going to be used in a high res capacity, a large format print after the fact. So I'm spending probably more time than I normally would on a regular e-commerce image to make sure that this is this is pretty pristine. I'll add highlights to the hair to kind of again push and pull to bring things forward, push things back, and it, it gives a nice kind of uh, uh, texture to it what would otherwise be a two-dimensional image. In the same round that this client requests uh, the glasses to be darkened, um, I, I do a pass of hair. Um, some of these flyaways or these wispy edges, um, they requested that they be taken down. And it's always a little tricky because while it feels like, you know, they're very light and they're very like, you know, easy to eliminate, it's very, very easy to make the hair look like a helmet, like a very odd shape. The wisp or the flyaways actually uh, lend itself to adding almost a visual gradient to the edge of the hair. And there's so many, so many images I see out there that have like such a hard edge on the hair and it's just a crispy looking weirdness that, uh, you know, some clients want and whatever, if that's what they want, it is what it is. And you know, you, you give them that. Um, but I personally, my personal preference, what my eyes are drawn to, like my artistic, my stylistic kind of preference is that there is a certain degree of natural gradient that happens with the edges of the hair. So, you know, when I'm applying that, I try to do that judiciously and with a light hand and to really be careful not to create some false edges um, for hair. Um, it just tends to look very, very bad. Again, going in here, adjusting some of these tonal issues. The texture looks good, but I see shadows down here and, and I wanna smooth them out a little bit. Content aware feel will work here, especially um, in the, that blurry layer um, where you just have color tone. Um, I'm just using the patch tool and just kind of pulling things out and over or over to new or better skin, which may be close by. That's also really important. Um, this is, it's a funny technique. Sometimes I will pull from skin that's completely not in the region just to, 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 it, it, what I found is it kind of neutralizes some, some harder areas. Like, um, I'm not sure. I can't remember if I do it here. Um, but I do use it as a technique when I'm working in an area and I can't find skin close by that will pull over or Photoshop's not letting me pull like a decent area of skin. I'll pull skin from an entirely other area and then rework it until it does blend. And that does work fairly well. All right, getting some last looks, making some final adjustments. I've gone ahead and uh, merged all of these visible layers because I realized as I was working through that her nose was a little off. It was a little unsymmetrical and it bothered me. And um, so once I knew that my retouch was generally done, now I can come in here. You could do this before, you know, that helps too. Um, that way you don't have to. Like if I had to come back and do, you know, some more revisions to the retouch, you know, at a base level, this would have been a little bit more obnoxious, but um, I felt very, fairly confident that I knew what this client wanted and, and uh, I was able to kind of come back in here and I didn't want to have to go all the way back and redo all that stuff just for the sake of liquefying this nose, kind of making it a little bit more symmetrical. So uh, what I did was I merged all my visible layers and created a new layer. And then from that layer, I'm liquefying the nose and the shape. And I believe I, I come in here and kind of mess with the lips a little bit and just kind of, again, get them nice and even. She has a pretty symmetrical face already. Again, I, I'm not trying to make it a robot. I just don't want it to look a little warped and distorted. Here's a before and after. She goes from looking pretty tired and kind of rough to just fresh and like a natural makeup and almost a little dewy and glowy, which I think is a good thing. And then I think what I do here for the client, this is a sunglasses or like an eyewear company. Um, so I wanted to add a little punch. So I do a high pass filter here and I'm gonna localize that right to the glasses to add again, a little bit more specularity. I drop the opacity down 50% because again, I don't want it so super, super obvious. I just want a little, little pop, a little crunch, a little texture. It's gonna add some pop to those highlights and that juxtaposed to a softer, a softer skin um, is gonna draw some 
visual uh, visual attention to the glasses, which is the product being sold. So that is the point. Adding a little bit more highlights, a little bit of texture to the hair, since it's so kind of like PC and the individuals are coming, the little individual strands are being highlighted. So I'm, I'm applying that same high pass filter to some of these pieces of hair and giving them some dimension. All right, getting these last looks, little details, little highlights, sampling out. This is just with a stamp tool. I'm uh, making sure that things look a little even, not so blotchy. I noticed that some of these areas weren't even um, and I'm making adjustments now. That one far window section there, this is a reflection of a window on the uh, on the floor of the studio, which showed up in the glasses. Um, because there was a chair, there actually used to be a chair there. Um, if you go back to the beginning of the video, you can see that there was a chair that I was removing. Um, there's still a lot of like the like pixel dirt almost, that's kind of how I would describe it, that's left in the area. So it's making that particular square of highlights um, a little bit darker. Uh, so I think what I end up doing is trying to match the color tone here. And um, first off, I'll, I'll draw in a levels layer to make some tonal adjustments. And then to kind of match the overall to color correct it, um, I, I clip down a hue sat layer to the levels, which is going to use the mask that is on the levels as a reference point and to uh, adjust the colors in there because they were also, I think, a little, a little magenta, a little red. Um, so we kind of adjust them in. And I was like, you know what, shoot, I should just add a levels layer, I think, to the rest of them. And that may bring them up. And I, I wanted to kind of control that a little bit. I don't want to be too much, but I thought that highlight was also kind of cool. So to bring attention to that, it helps. Now I'm going back to the same levels adjustment that I have already placed on the other one so that they're all kind of sitting on the, on the same layer. Now on the second, on the other glasses, on the other uh, eye, I should say, there is also a little reflection of the floor, which kind of adds a cool highlight right across the eye. And it's also why that bottom section that I've just circled out also looks a little bit more fuzzy. And again, I, I'm trying to draw attention away from the fact that they requested a lot of work in there. Um, there wasn't a lot of source material to use in the first place, so you, you know, this becomes one of those challenges. How do I kind of deflect attention? This is the section of the eye that looks good and we can add a reflection, but that's obviously way too hard. So we soften it down and I believe I add a mask to the gradient. Um, I feather the edges of the mask and I'm gonna add a gradient here to soften out that attention. All right, just working through the details. Getting some last looks on it. This thing is coming in for a landing. Again, I eventually come back in here and do some more adjustments to the eyes at a, a later time. But this is almost at a place where I am happy enough to kind of send this to the client to get a review. And, and that's another trick too, you know, kind of dealing with clients. And, uh, you know, you could spend, like I said earlier, like you could spend so much time perfecting an image and, and perfection is, is, is a bit subjective. You know, what you feel is perfect, that client may not. So, you know, what's the sense in taking this up to a thousand percent and, you know, only to have to go back and rework it again. So I like to take it to like 80 to 90 and let that last, um, that last look be given to the client. Now, this is the JPEG that I was referencing earlier. Um, and I feel like you can see that there's a quality difference. Um, what I ended up noticing here, you see it at the bottom, is that I'm having a bit of a graphics issue, but it doesn't end up in the, in the final image. And you can tell, because as I zoom in and out, um, you know, it pops on and off. And if you look at all of my masks, you're not seeing any of that uh, reflected in any of the masks. I'd like to double check, because sometimes this happens. Sometimes I'll be working on something and a selection was, uh, uh, somewhere else that I, I, I wasn't aware of and you know it changes the mask but um, I'm not seeing it there so I know it's a graphics card issue I may have needed to 
restart my computer at this point, but um, uh, for all intents and purposes, this image is basically done. Um, I'm cross-checking it with that JPEG just to make sure that the quality is a little bit better, a little bit more detail-oriented, um, because again, the end usage for this is not the same as the end usage for the other one. As you can see, I've left a little bit more detail in here. You can see the chair has been removed. And that's pretty much it, guys. We are winding down. And again, this is dealing with skin uh, and clients uh, in particular and how to achieve a, a, a flawless skin attack in your images every single time. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we will see you in the next one.